How do you do? Thanks for the invitation. Brilliant. Okay. So, Emma, are you, are you okay with um, allowing me to share my PowerPoint presentation at some point? Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, I think uh, hopefully it's going to work now as you want to set it up. Uh... Okay, super. Shall I try doing that now just as a test? Yeah, of course. Okay. Right. So, how is that? Is that coming through okay? Yeah, it looks great. Brilliant. Splendid. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, it didn't work last week. And uh, in yeah. the first Sustain talk, we wouldn't be able to record even if we wanted, uh, apparently, because uh, I wasn't. Oh, right. I, I wasn't the host at that time, too. Okay. Okay. Great. Well, I'll just stop, stop sharing for now and um, leave this in your capable hands, Emery. <laughs> like, or... well, I, will, I will leave the word to you very soon. Uh... Okay, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. How many have we got? A few. Hello, Helen. Hello, Nick. Hello. Hello. Is it Liu? Yes, indeed. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Where are you from, Liu? Nice to meet you. Computer science. Computer science. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, you did. We can help. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> are you located just behind the business school then? Yes, indeed. Oh, we must meet up sometime. Can you help? Yes, probably. Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Great. Great. Indeed. Yeah. So how long have you been with us at Edge Hill? Since September 2018. Oh, same as me. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> but you've been, you've been yeah, together. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Ah, great stuff. You did it, yeah. yeah. Well, let me, my, my cuckoo clock has just struck 12. Okay, uh, so, welcome everybody. Uh, I would like to welcome everyone to our second talk in the Business School Seminar Series. We are very pleased to have Chris today. Uh, he's going <clears> to talk about uh, climate action through tra trade agreements. And Chris. Thank you very much indeed, Emily. This is also a, another co-hosted Business School SustainNet webinar. It's really good to uh, see you all. Thank you very much for being here. So my talk is on Climate action through trade agreements. Can you all see the screen okay? The, uh, the, the first page of my presentation. Yes, okay. indeed. Yeah. Great, so thank you. This is um, based on research that I've been doing this year on climate relevant provisions that are being included in free trade agreements in particular. So it combines my, my two kind of passions, I guess you could say, trade and climate uh, action. So what are the kind of connections uh, between these two uh, things? I'm just trying to actually go on to the next slide and it's not working. So let me just try that again. Oh, here we go. Fantastic. Right. So as we know, climate action is taking place on, on multiple fronts and business and economics are really important to understanding both the causes and solutions uh, to climate change. Now, in that context, trade is becoming increasingly relevant to climate action, because if you look at the global economy and what happens in the global economy has a big impact on climate action, as we know, trade has become an increasingly important feature of the global economy. So if you go back to the 1970s, trade represented about 70 percent of the global economy, uh, gross domestic product. But today, despite a few bumps in the road <laughs> we've had in recent years, trade represents 60% uh, of the global economy at the start of the 2020s. Now, trade itself has a quite a complex relationship with the environment and climate change. We can talk about whether it has a, a negative or positive impact. There's a number of different kind of issues you can discuss there. Um, but if we look at how trade is actually governed, the rules, the regulations, the laws which govern trade, we, we have the, the World Trade Organization and its predecessor GATT, which have been trying to govern the world trade system since the 1940s, but it's recently faltered. And in that kind of vacuum, uh, you've seen 
trade agreements and particularly free trade agreements proliferate in number to fill the gap um, left by the World Trade Organization. So the last time we had a big trade agreement, a global trade agreement, was back in the mid 1990s, the Uruguay round. And it's been trying to establish um, a, a new global round since the early 2000s, but has faltered. Also, the WTO has hardly anything to say on climate action. It has no rules, no agreements uh, on climate action. So in that kind of vacuum, you've got free trade agreements trying to uh, shape the trade policy and trade environment globally, albeit on a very kind of, uh, kind of ad hoc, uh, kind of messy uh, kind of way. So the two questions I'm going to ask today is what kind of climate action content do we find in free trade agreements and how might climate action occur through free trade agreements themselves? So let's now look at the rise of free trade agreements in the global trade system. So here we have a chart. Now it says that uh, it's RTAs here, regional trade agreements, which is what the WTO used to uh, for uh, free trade agreements in effect. And you can see that there was a rise in FTAs from the 1990s onwards. And now you've got around 300 currently in force in the world trade system. Now, what do they look like, FTAs? What I've got here is, first of all, a typical US free trade agreement, this one being particular with, especially with uh, Australia. And what I've done is I've put down the chapter headings for the FTA that the US has with Australia. Now, what's interesting about the US is it has quite a hard template when it comes to doing FTA, and it's particularly strong on market access, commercial regulation, rules which govern business, such as intellectual property rights, government procurement, investment and finance uh, regulations, and also trying to export uh, kind of US legislative norms on commerce and business to other countries through FTAs. So if you look at the intellectual property rights chapters of, F of US FTAs, they, are, they have around between eight and 10 uh, to 12,000 words of regulations that are more or less taken verbatim from US uh, laws on IPR themselves and then embedded in these agreements and then other countries have to comply with them. Now, the US, as I mentioned a bit later, is quite strong on environment but on a regulatory compliance kind of way, but it's, it's interestingly not very strong on climate action. So where it has quite strong laws on, for example, endangered species trade and on biodiversity, it doesn't have that much on climate action. Now you compare that then to the US approach. This is the chapter structure of the recent EU Japan FTA, which interestingly doesn't call technically an FTA, but an economic partnership agreement. Now that's quite kind of revealing of the different way that the EU takes ideologically and conceptually towards FTAs in that they see them much more than just a trade agreement. They're kind of a wider economic cooperation and partnership kind of agreement um, in most cases. So you can see there are still quite strong similarities with the kind of uh, the commercial regulations and other rules governing trade with the US approach. So there's stuff on intellectual property, competition policy, government procurement, technical barriers to trade. But who can spot the climate relevant chapter there in that list? Any takers? Give you clues around the middle of the list. Trade and sustainable development, Chris? Yes, well done, Alison. Gold star to you. Brilliant. <laughs> now, I'll come back and talk about the trade and sustainable development chapter in, in, in EU FTAs in a moment. But the EU takes a much more kind of open, flexible and cooperative stance in its FTAs compared to the US. And one key theme of this presentation is the role of the EU as the global leader on climate action. And this is going to be important when we look at the evidence 
um, of climate relevant F, uh, provisions in FTAs later on in the talk. So, okay, trade and climate, what are the kind of key issues? Where do they overlap? Where do they intersect? So when I was doing my research, I was thinking, okay, so you've got this kind of connection between trade and climate. So what are the kind of key, what I call empirical domains where that connection exists? How is trade relevant to climate and how is climate relevant to trade? So I've got these six kind of different areas or issue areas or empirical domains where trade and climate kind of meet. So firstly, carbon tariffs, trading, markets and sinks. So if you take, for example, what happens with most trade, it's, it takes place by sea, by ship, and increasingly by containerized ship, these big 40 foot long metal boxes in which we put things like mobile phones, electronic equipment, auto parts into these boxes, and then they're transported from one part of the planet to another. Now, in my <laughs> business economics class, what I often will show them is a bag of mange too, or some other exotic vegetables and fruit and get them to look at where it's come from. If you go into a supermarket and you find a bag of mange too, invariably it comes from either South America or Africa. So we even fly, we fly mange too into our supermarkets from countries like Peru and Zambia. Now, often it's put on a plane, <laughs> okay? Uh, not first class, obviously, uh, but you know, vegetable class on a big cargo plane but there's a carbon footprint for every single product that we transfer from one part of the planet to another because ships and air cargo planes use fuel. Uh, they use fossil fuels, so kerosene or diesel. So um, uh, one thing that has been discussed is how you can apply carbon tariffs on traded products, depending on where they've come from and their volume and their weight. Uh, a second uh, empirical domain is how FTAs can be used to promote the promote trade in climate relevant products like uh, solar panels and liberalization in the trade of those products so reducing trade barriers like tariffs. Now one problem you got there <laughs> is agreeing on what is a climate relevant product what is say for example a clean energy product. So if you take, for example, uh, the geothermal sector, it's a renewable energy sector, the same drilling equipment that you use for tapping into geothermal energy below the planet's surface is the same drilling equipment that you use in the fossil fuel industry for exploring oil and gas. <laughs> so are those products <coughs> in renewable energy uh, development eligible to be deemed to be climate relevant project, uh, products. Um, ball bearings used in wind, wind turbines also used in other heavy electrical engineering uh, equipment. Are those ball bearing component parts part of the clean energy kind of domain or are they, are they not? This is one of the big problems you've got with trying to promote and liberalize trade in clean energy products. Now, clean energy itself is very, very important to climate action because if you think about what you know, climate change is about, it's, it's mainly about the pumping of, of greenhouse gas emissions, especially carbon dioxide, into the atmosphere. Most of that can be linked back to uh, fossil fuels and energy. Um, so promoting clean energy is a, is a vitally important domain of uh, the trade climate nexus. Then you've got fourth, the environmental and technical standards. This could be, for example, on emission uh, standards on vehicles, which are uh, traded between uh, countries. They could be on pollution abatement equipment. And then fifthly, you've got trade transportation, uh, maritime and aviation emissions that come from moving things around the planet because we are moving more and more things across the planet in our globalizing world economy. So that's another area in the trade climate nexus. And then lastly, how the trade regime overseen at the moment globally by the WTO and the climate regime overseen mainly at the moment by the UNFCCC, 
uh, the United Nations Framework on Convention on Climate Change, how do they actually interact? Because global institutions are supposed to govern how we address global challenges like trade, like uh, climate action. But how do these global interact, uh, institutions interact when they've got some common issues to, to co-manage? And that's another area which we'll explore in the, in the research that I've done in this area. So what I did was to try to kind of uh, classify climate action in free trade agreements. What I did was I, I looked at previous research in this area and there has been some really, really good work already done on looking at the broader relationship between trade and environment. And it's called the Trade Environment Database or TREND. Now, <laughs> this database covers over 300 different provisions which could in some way be environment related. But what I've done is I focus specifically on climate action provisions and I've adapted and reinterpreted their own database on this and extended the range of climate relevant provisions in FTAs to 14 different types of provision. So you can see these listed here in this table. So um, what I've done is I've listed these by and they're kind of color coded mapping onto the trend database chapter structure. So you can see the ones in the kind of likely blue. This comes under the climate action provisions of the trend database. The orange one is relating to um, environmental kind of standards. The pink ones are to do with the interaction between trade and climate regimes, say between the WTO and the uh, UNFCCC. And then I've mapped the empirical domains next to these. And then I've got some examples of where these provisions are first introduced into an FTA. So for example, provisions that promote cooperation between the FTA trade partners on climate change adaptation, the first time you get that mentioned is in the China Costa Rica FTA of uh, 2010. Liu, there you go, there's a bit of reference there automatically to China. Very important trade partner, of course, to us all. So that's what I've done. That's, that's how I actually did it kind of methodologically. Okay, so what I then did was look through every single 305 FTAs currently in force. And I identified of those 305 that there are 69 FTAs currently in force, which have at least one of those climate relevant provisions. Now, if you look at the history of this, the first climate relevant provision that I was able to find was interestingly in an African regional FTA signed in 1983. And African regional FTAs actually are quite important in the early phase of climate relevant provisions. Then the EU starts to kick in its interest and activity from the 1990s. And if I'm now going to, if I'm just going to now give you the full kind of list of FTAs in this table. So I'm just going to come out and go into this next table. Okay, can you see this okay? So I'm just going to move the zoom window over. So this is the start of the table there. And you can see what I've done is on the, um, the columns, I put each of the 14 climate relevant provisions and you can see the pattern over time. Now I'm going to make some general observation of the patterns, but I'm just going to scroll down. And you can see that over time, it gradually becomes denser and denser in terms of the number of provisions, what I call bandwidth. So bandwidth relates to the number of provisions that have been included in FTAs over time. And you can see that the one with the, the widest bandwidth with 12 climate uh, relevant provisions out of 14 is the EU Armenia <laughs> FTA signed in 1918, uh, sorry, 2018. So those are the, uh, all of the 69 FTAs that I found with climate relevant provisions. Right, so 
general observations then you can make about those trends. And I'm going to introduce some other tables in a moment. But what was interesting is the early climate relevant provisions in a way happened by accident <laughs> in that they happened in African regional FTAs where the main focus was on renewable energy promotion, promoting sectors like hydro, biomass, wind, solar, geothermal. But if you look at the actual text of the F FTAs, what was interesting was that they were being promoted, those energy sectors, in an energy security and industrial development context rather than an environmental one. Now, what I mean by that is that by promoting renewable energy sectors like hydro and, and wind and solar, they were diversifying their energy mix, these African countries. So uh, reducing energy security risk, because the great thing about renewable energy is that it is an indigenously developed FTA. You don't have to import wind or solar or hydro, but you do oil, gas and coal often. So it reduces your import dependency, okay, on foreign powers who may have some sort of hold over you uh, further on down the line. Secondly, the industrial development context was this is a way of these economies in Africa diversifying their economies into new areas of activity. So those are the two main contexts. It wasn't necessarily an environmentally motivated one, but of course it would have had a environment, positive environmental effects by them doing that, promoting those sectors. Uh, the second kind of trend to observe was when the EU started to get involved in climate relevant FTAs in the early 1990s, this was a, a set of uh, FTAs with East European countries as part of their pre-accession process to joining the EU. So with countries such as Poland, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria. And what you found here was the, was the climate relevant provisions were heavily weighted towards energy efficiency because these countries had big inefficient energy sectors pumping out a lot of pollution that was traveling across borders into EU member states. And this was causing the EU problems. So it's more of a localized kind of uh, climate or environmental issue rather than the big issue of global warming. Third observation is that there was policy innovation up to 2010 in that new kinds of climate relevant provisions were being gradually introduced into the mix. But the number of, of climate relevant provisions being included in, in, in FTAs was really, really small, no more than like two or three types. So the bandwidth was really, really uh, small. This though uh, began to change after the, sorry, let's hang on a second. I've got builders in, they're making more. Hi guys, excuse me. You could just be quiet for a bit. Um, sorry about that. <laughs> um, so the, uh, the bandwidth of FTAs began to then change in the 2010 decade, especially after the EU career FTA was signed, which created a kind of a benchmark for innovation and linking trade with sustainable development in particular. A another observation to make is that, and I'll explore this a bit later, is that the provisions uh, themselves lacked legal and regulatory weight. They were mainly focused on cooperative efforts. So these two parties stating in their FTA that they would cooperate on a range of climate relevant areas, but that actually there was, it was more kind of, um, in many cases, it was, it was simply kind of statements of intent rather than actually any legalized commitments or regulatory commitments. Now more on that in a, in a moment. Okay, so what I've got here is looking at the key trade partners up to 2010 that were engaged in introducing and using climate relevant provisions in their FTAs. The EU as we see is, is really very central to this whole process. But other key trade partners are South Korea or Korea, interestingly, Peru and Chile, Canada, Japan. So that, this is a, a map basically of those trade partners engaged in introducing climate relevant provisions into FTAs and the links between them 
So you can see the thick line here between the EU and Korea. That's the, the FTA between those two trade partners. And it was by far the, by this time, up to 2010, the most substantive agreement on climate action. So China and Central America, China and Peru, Peru and Canada. You can see there are some linkages emerging there, okay? Between these key trade partners. Now let's move forward 10 years to 2020. This is the picture. You can see there's been quite an intensification, both in terms of the numbers of key trade partners involved in introducing climate relevant provisions into their FTAs and the bandwidth and generally the number of provisions per agreement uh, is also broadened uh, significantly. Now you'll notice that the US is not very active um, in this. And as I mentioned earlier, it's strong on environment, but it's actually weak on climate. Now I'm gonna be kind of mentioning later how that might possibly change after January 2021 with a new US president who is much more pro-climate action, shall we say the incumbent president of the United States. But of course, it all depends on Congress passing through laws. Anyway, more on that later. Okay, so uh, what I've got here is a trade partner list showing you which have been the most active trade partners on introducing climate relevant provisions. So you've got the 14 different types there, and then you've got the list of countries there and um, how many provisions in total have they got across all their FTAs with climate relevant provisions. So if you take the, EU, uh, the EU, it currently has 44 FTAs currently in force. Now of them, though, only 21 have climate relevant provisions. So only 48% of their FTAs currently have uh, climate relevant provisions in. However, if you look at the FTAs the EU has signed in the last 10 years, that figure goes up to 67%. And that's the total number of provisions they have in all their FTAs on climate. Korea uh, has a high percentage. 60% uh, of all its FTAs have climate relevant provisions, and that goes up to 70% when you look at the last 10 years. Uh, if you contrast that with another East Asian country, Singapore, Singapore only has 16%, only three of its 19 FTAs actually have climate. They're not that kind of interested in them. The EU, sorry, the US, only six of its 15, so only 40%. So climate action is slowly becoming a trade agreement norm. And it, it has been growing quite fast, but still from a relatively limited base, and there's still a lot more that could be done. Okay, so the next uh, topic I want to look at, um, to look at this, this evidence further, is looking at something called norms, and climate norms in particular in FTA. So we can define a norm as actions, ideas, or practices that become commonly adopted by actors forming the basis of standardized or normalized behavior. We can also then look at norm leadership and norm influence. So norm leadership relates to primarily to norm innovation, introducing new ways and thinking about things, new actions, new policy practices on climate or other, other kind of uh, areas of, of action laying down new benchmark norms and practices. So norm influence then is how an actor, e.g. a trade partner, can shape or inspire the behavior of others. So of course, norm leaders invariably are the most important norm influences because they're the ones who are innovating and introducing new ways of, of doing things essentially, but Norm influence itself will depend on its normative power, its capacity and capability to project and uh, their own ideas, ideologies, values, actions, practices to other partners and for them to adopt them. So almost like a persuasive power 
of getting others to adopt your own ways of doing things. Now, there has been work on the EU as a, a normative power. There's been some work by um, a scholar called um, Manning who developed this concept called normative power Europe and its ability to get other countries to adopt stronger actions on climate, human rights, social justice, et cetera. Kind of linked to that concept is another one called market power Europe, which looks at the EU in a more geopolitical power way and its ability to influence the economic, business, commercial, and trade policies of other countries through its sheer institutionalized power, okay, of its diplomatic channels, its intellectual capital that it, it kind of uses to persuade other countries to adopt its ways of doing things. Now, of course, the EU is not alone in doing this. Uh, the US, of course, also exercises significant, if not even greater, some would argue, normative power internationally. And increasingly, China, of course, uh, if you look at things like the Belt and Road Initiative and how it's developing new channels of influence over a number of different countries. Uh, Japan, um, in certain ways as well, another important trade power. Um, but it's in climate, on climate action through trade agreements, it's those partners with significant provision bandwidth and the larger number of agreements that are better positioned to influence the trade uh, and climate norms of other countries. And the EU is uniquely positioned to do this because one, it's interested in doing so, and two, it has normative power to do so as well in that, to that level. So what I want to do now is just look at how the EU's done this. And of course, it, it's able to exercise this influence though, with especially with countries that are more open and compliant with doing something similar. So Korea has been quite an important partner for the EU in this. Now, the EU Korea FTA was signed in 2010, but FTAs, as you, most of you probably know, take a long time to negotiate. Um, so Korea at the time, talking about 10, 12 years ago, was trying to restructure its economy into being a, a greener industrial green growth economy after the wake of the global financial crisis. So the then president of Korea, Lee, Mi, uh, Lee Young Bak, uh, was quite a key figure in pushing a green fiscal stimulus across the whole G20 group uh, back about 10, 12 years ago. Moreover, he was very keen to push Korea as a green power on the international stage. And I can take questions on that and how that worked out, but Korea was also like the EU, interested in taking the trade climate nexus to the next kind of level. So I mentioned the trade and sustainable development chapter in the EU Japan FTA, which Alison very um, smartly recognized. Um, this has been a norm that the EU has replicated in more or less every single FTA it's signed after 2010. So you'll find a trade and sustainable development chapter in most EU FTAs after this one was signed. So what I've done is I've taken the text from this chapter, I've taken certain articles, these are kind of the provision text, just to show you the nature of what these trade partners have agreed to do. So Article 13.5 of the agreement under the Chapter 13 heading, Traded and Sustainable Development. Uh, this is about multilateral environmental agreements and how both of these trade partners are affirming their cooperation together to work to supporting the UNFCCC and the, let's move the box out of the way, Kyoto Protocol of 1997 on you know, climate action generally. Then there's uh, Article 13.6, which they talk about striving to facilitate and promote trade and foreign direct investment in environmental goods and services, including 
all those things listed there, okay? Eco labeling of goods and so on. Then if you go into the annex, you'll find a bit more detail. And I'm gonna read all this out. But what they've done there is they've kind of action structured this cooperation. They've identified various kind of different issues that they're going to uh, work on together, uh, even including things like um, social and environmental aspects, doing international labor organization also mentioned there, um, UNEP program, other multilateral environmental agreements. Uh, I think there's some mention on corporate social responsibility of firms as well. They're working on that area. So you can see that cooperation is the main focus. So all of this cooperation in this particular FTA, though, is going to be operationalized in an institutional structure, creating new kind of bodies to oversee this process, review meetings, making sure all these kind of actions are followed through with some meaningful actions. That's the plan anyway. Now, what is interesting then, if you look at the actual content and the emphasis of climate action through these trade agreements, when you think of free trade agreements, the first thing that may come to your mind is liberalization and that they're going to make a free trade environment between the trade partners. Now, that has kind of been, that concept has been stretched somewhat because first of all, the nature of trade liberalization itself is, is a, evolved and changed quite significantly over recent years. In many sectors, tariffs are not important. If you look at the electronic sector, they're virtually zero. So what becomes more important are other things which either promote trade or remove other kinds of barriers to, uh, to trade happening. So what you find then is on climate, the current emphasis is not on liberalization, it's actually on cooperation. So then what I did was I, I looked at every single FTA provision and all of the 69 FTAs that had them and I analyzed the text and then what I did was on the cooperation, I then classified that cooperation um, according to four different progressive levels of cooperation. So you start off at the lowest level, optional. And this is simply where parties do not expressly commit to cooperate on climate action, but rather leave it as an optional thing using conditional language like we may do this, it's possible for us to do this, there's potential to do cooperation in that area. Then there's intentional cooperation where you've got explicit statements of intent to cooperate with, cer with certain climate relevant issues identified, but lacking on detail about how they're actually going to cooperate in terms of actions, methods, and objectives. At action structured level though, they progress to identifying all those things, what the cooperation is gonna be and what actions are gonna do to undertake that cooperation. And then at the final higher level of cooperation, programmatic, there is a programmatic plan of action with targets and schedules and institutionalized arrangements for them to do it. Now, let's have a look and see how that plays out in the, uh, oh, actually no, so I've got to, <laughs> one other slide before we get onto the table on cooperation, right? So another way of looking at this cooperation is what kind of different conceptual features does it often have? So is it institutionalized? Are there plans in place to actually do something substantive on this cooperation? Um, what bodies and commissions are gonna be involved? A second feature is, is there a kind of, a, what I call an assistive element to this in that the developed country partner of the FTA, such as the EU or Japan or Korea, takes it upon themselves to capacity build with the their lesser developed trade partner to help them better improve their capacity to take climate actions. A third kind of feature you often find is both of them, like we saw with the EU Korea one, actually stating we're going to work together to build the climate, the global climate on a uh, global sorry, regime on climate action. We're going to reaffirm our commitments to the Paris Agreement, the Kyoto Protocol and the UNFCCC generally. Now, if you then look at the 
the different types of cooperation over the uh, the number of FTAs that, in fact, there are 62 of the 69 have cooperative climate action provisions. This is what you find. So this is the first 24 listed. I'm just going to go out now and go to the table which has all these measures listed. Let's move the zoom box. So if you look at um, them here, the key thing to look out for is the number of words which are given over to cooperation, what percentage those words are on cooperation of all the text on climate relevant provisions. So you can see that of the first, what is it, 20 listed here, that they all solely focused on climate action cooperation. If you go down to the uh, Japan Brunei one, number 22, you can see that it's only 42% of the content. And then look at the thematic headings, where this cooperation is actually coming in the FTA. Now, what you'll see is, if you look at the headings, you can see that trade and sustainable development makes a entry here with the EU career FTA. And then it becomes adopted by other countries such as the EFTA group. And then it becomes uh, also, you can see how it matches against all the EU FTAs as well. So you've got 23 different headings under which this cooperation is being framed. So it can range from anything, infrastructure, agriculture, uh, energy, industry. Um, there's even one, I think, on meteorological services, um, weather data uh, reporting, cooperation on that relating to climate uh, change. Um, so that's kind of what the nature of the cooperation in these FTAs looks like. And what you've got here is a totaling of all the different types of provisions under the classifications I just went through. So optional uh, cooperation, there's eight FTAs with that, with, uh, what was the next one? Um, was it intentional, 18? action structured 32 and programmatic only four. So if you look at the trends, the cooperation is becoming more and more substantive, but it still lacks kind of the higher levels of cooperation, action structured and programmatic overall. Okay, now almost finished now. Um, just quickly, because I see that time is pressing on a bit. Um, what I then did was I looked at where there are liberalization specific provisions on climate action. And in contrast to the 62 FTAs that have cooperation out of the 69 in total, only 20 of the 69 have any provisions relating to climate relevant trade liberalization. And the, the kind of uh, the, the emphasis here is, is also quite diverse. I've got six different classifications there. It's the weight of emphasis is really very strongly skewed towards cooperation rather than liberalization. Now, concluding points uh, to finish off the talk. So, okay, climate relevant provisions in free trade agreements were first introduced in the 1980s, but they've become substantively developed only really in the last 10 years. There being, it was relatively weak kind of development up to then. It's been a somewhat uneven and skewed development, but you do have increasing number of trade partners engaged in this process. The kind of community of nations which are engaging in climate action through trade is expanding and the bandwidth is growing but it still remains relatively limited when you compare this to other provisions in FTA. So you may remember that I, I mentioned that on intellectual property, the Americans normally devote about eight to 12,000 words on intellectual property rights for every FTA. The FTA with the most content on climate action 
in the world only has less than 1,500 words devoted to it. And moreover, it lacks legal and reg regulatory weight. It's mainly on cooperation. Also climate relevant to other environmental issues, the Americans in particular put greater emphasis on non-climate environmental issues. Now that may change with President Biden coming in, but don't know. But what will, what will need to happen for climate action through trade agreements to become more significant and impactful? Well, you need to have more trade partners stepping up and joining the game, especially the United States. The provisions themselves need to have more legal and regulatory weight. The WTO needs to pull its finger out and get involved in the game in the first place because it has no rules on climate, nothing. If you look at, interestingly, when you go to the WTO website and you look at climate, what they say in climate, their climate page was last updated in 2009, right, 11 years ago. <laughs> Also, the, the UNFCCC needs to become more engaged in trade issues. It only mentions trade once in the Paris Agreement, for example. And countries that are engaged in climate action, they need to raise their game on cooperation, make it more programmatic, uh, more institutionalized, more substantive. Now, one interesting kind of ray of hope here is the, a recent trade climate sustainability agreement that was initiated in September last year by New Zealand, Norway, Costa Rica, Fiji, Iceland, and Switzerland. Now just think about that group of countries and how globally dispersed they are, and yet they're coming together to form a trade agreement. Okay, so from the Pacific, from Europe, from the Americas, uh, they're trying to forge a new kind of trade agreement, the trade climate agreement. And this connects to the last point I want to make, is that the trade agenda itself is fast evolving. It's trying to evolve into covering new areas of challenge because trade is so interlinked with different aspects, not just of the global economy, but of global society and its impact there that trade is very interconnected to many challenge issues. And so you may find new kinds of trade agreement develop and, and evolve in the future, especially if trade and climate can be brought closer together in this way. Thank you very much indeed uh, for listening. Uh, that's the end of my presentation. Very happy to take questions uh, afterwards. Thank you, Chris. <clears throat> Some great insights there. It's me, Nick. Hi, Nick. How are you? Um, yeah. Obviously, I do a lot on the tourism trade and that kind of thing. I was, I was interested if you had any references to that element or that component with regards to you know, FTAs and climate, climate nexus and tourism. Yes, yes. Um, so... The, I think I, I have to do some uh, kind of um, looking through all the the, uh, the text that I've gathered of these FTAs together to see any references to things like ecotourism, Nick. But yes, certainly as an, as an emerging kind of climate relevant uh, sector, you, you could see more on more commentary on ecotourism in trade agreements going forward. Certainly tourism is a an area covered in, in trade agreements. It's not that high profile of one, um, but it's, yeah, it's definitely something that could be uh, increasingly important going forward. I have to kind of do a bit more digging around. Yeah, of course, we'd be yeah. interested yeah. to have a chat with you about that. I've just got yeah. this clip yeah. as well of, of uh, um, I suppose like interviews across um, the coast of Mexico, I think around Cancun and that, and there's a, uh, some uh, insights with regards to local fisher folk that were referring to the WTO as Diablo, the devil, yeah. you know, and then these sweeping yeah. images yeah. of, um, you know, quite neoliberal kind of developments of, you know, the big, you know, multinational 
trade names that we're all aware of, you know, along yes. the coast lines of these these um, these places. Yeah. But anyway, I mean, yeah. one key point to make about trade is that, technically speaking, trade takes place between companies, not between countries. It's it's companies that actually organise the trade and actually do the trade. So, and it's also a question. Trade is a question of power as well. When you've got large organizations, multinationals, which organize trade in increasingly complex ways with international supply chains and the rest of it, um, they do make a real difference in terms of shaping the nature of trade and how sustainable that is. Now, there is increasingly companies which are becoming more enlightened on this and are looking to, on their supply chains, for example, uh, only work with suppliers who are able to commit to a kind of a net or a plan for net carbon zero uh, kind of situation or, or, or goal. Um, there's something called scope one, two and three emissions, which these companies use to manage the trade in their international supply chains. Um, so, yeah, companies play a really key role in this whole process because they're the ones doing the trade and they're often the ones that can set new sustainable norms of practice those that are more enlightened um, in that way shall we say hi hi chris yeah. can I ask you? hi jeff good to see hi. you yeah first of all fascinating by the way i really enjoyed the talk uh, yeah i mean i thought you brought up some really really important issues and, and I'm, I'm just again trying to get my head around what those issues are um I suppose my first issue is, and I know nothing about free trade agreements, but obviously because of Brexit, we're hearing a little bit more about, about trade yeah. agreements than we did before. And I suppose my first question really is, uh, but I was mindful of your analysis, looking at text and counting amount of stuff dedicated to X rather than Y. And mm. I suppose, and, and I, I'm fascinated by your idea of normalization and, and what that process involves. But I suppose my question really is, do, does this analysis tell us more about what you might call the semiotics of trade agreements or, or, the, or the grammar of trade agreements rather than about action? Because in some yes, sense, yeah. conversation <laughs> is, is about countries signing up to something which is acceptable. And it just seems to me that, that I, know, I noticed that Russia didn't appear at all in, your, uh, in, in the tables, but I, but I suppose the issue is that all of these countries have got a different, very different political pressures Mm. Uh, which constrains what they can and cannot do. Uh, but of course, trade's important. So, so the, the normalization is one of signing up to a, to a, to a, to a code of communication. And, and, and it is kind of alarming that the discourse was all about intention and, and cooperation and all the good stuff rather than yes. about, about the regulation. And we're going to make sure that you're actually doing it. And, and I was fascinated by the way you got onto multinationals there because. Isn't it the case, do, do, no, as a question, do, do, do you think it's the case that multinationals see what they do despite countries rather than assisted by countries, that, that they're in some, they would see themselves, as it would be my understanding, as driving the agenda, the real agenda, the agenda of change, and not the agenda of, of political discourse and what's acceptable and what's no longer acceptable. So I suppose, you can tell I'm thinking a lot, but this is all building up to the question is, is the normalization process normalization of discourse and, and, and what's the acceptable grammar of doing an agreement mm. or normalization of norms of behavior? That's a very good question, Jeff, and I thought you might ask that. <laughs> um, I think it's, you raised some really, really important points because when I was doing this research all this year, the back of my mind was also always, so how are these words going to lead to actual action on tackling climate change. Um, and what I would love to have done, if the circumstances and funding <laughs> have permitted, because I'm doing this just as desk research, essentially, not uh, go out and funded, is to actually go and talk to the negotiators who laid down this text and ask them more about it, the kind of questions which you, you raised there, because each country does have its own kind of political constraints and what it or, or determinants of what actually happens on international agreements and also the, the vocabulary and the ways and the phraseology that they use to lay down their international treaties. Um, 
so yeah and then, and then the question of even even if these trade agreements are put in place and are even operationalized you know the cooperation that that what they've stated here actually leads to concrete action to what extent does it actually shape the trade between the trade partners themselves organized through through companies how do companies get involved in the cooperation which is stated framed in these agreements that's something we'd really love to know uh so that would be if i was able to take this research further forward i would love to ask these questions both to the policymakers and negotiators who, who brokered these agreements but also to companies who may be involved in some of these um actions as outlined <laughs> articulated in the agreements but i think you raised some really important points there um jeff thank you for that yeah thank you thanks great talk oh thank you very much thanks yeah <laughs> try my best <laughs> anyone else got any other questions yes tim hello um yeah i'm, I'm uh, this is a very tentative question because i'm based in the faculty of education so i'm just sort of dipping my toe in the water of business um but it, it's really about china because china didn't seem to um feature prominently there in your in your list uh, but my understanding is that the chinese communist party adopted um, as an official goal this idea of an ecological civilization yeah. and um so i'm not I, i'm not particularly expert on on china's kind of global leadership of sustainability but i'm just wondering whether there's any there are any signs of that feeding through into trade and free, free trade uh, agreements that you've detected. Yeah, very good point, Tim. Thank you very much. So um, I'm quite familiar with China's economy and trade policy. China has only really started in recent years to develop its free trade agreement policy after it joined the WTO back about 18, 19 years ago. And what it does is it takes quite a, um, there are some similarities with the EU and J Japanese approach in that they, they place more emphasis on trade agreements being broader economic partnership and economic cooperation agreements. What they tend to avoid is using FTAs like the Americans do for laying down some really hard legal rights-based uh, regulatory rules in their trade agreements. Um, they're a little bit more kind of open and, and flexible when it comes to FTAs generally. Now, on climate-related um, things or environment-related things, you will find that the Chinese are open to the idea of environmental cooperation and you know, the, the old idea of ecological modernization and civilization has been around in China for the last uh, almost two decades now. And but it's, it's quite broadly framed. Any, any kind of commitment to cooperating on climate relevant actions, you, you won't find too much kind of regulatory or legal specificity, but that's not uncommon in climate relevant provisions and FTAs generally. Yeah. I think that, okay, so two months ago, um, Xi Jinping announced that the goal of China becoming a net carbon zero economy by 2060. And you may find that with that kind of background in mind or that kind of overarching goal for China in the background there, that that might kind of shape and feed into how China does FTAs going forward from here. It's engaged in quite a big regional FTA called the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership with 15, or is it, no, it's 14 now, 14 other Asia Pacific countries, including Japan, South Korea, Southeast Asian, 10 ASEAN group, Australia, and New Zealand. And you've got countries there which are quite, a, quite open to doing work on climate action, um, but that has, it's still in negotiation. So we'll have to wait and see. But certainly China could be a really important, significant player on making positive links between trade and climate. But yeah, again, it depends on what's going on at the domestic political agenda in China, like it does in all the trade partners you look at. 
Thank you. I'm going to have to take my leave because I've got some students waiting for oh, me. Oh, thank you, Tim. Online. Nice to meet thank, you. And thank, thank you very, very much for being part of it. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Bye -bye. Thank you. OK, anyone else got any other questions? Yes, Alison. Hello. Hi there. Um, I'm just going to be really cynical. So if these trade agreements aren't um, able to be monitored or you know, lack teeth, then are they just simply functioning as allowing the business, the companies in these different countries to basically do what they like? So are they a necessary first step to be able to say companies in country X can now work with companies in country Y or um, sell their products, vice versa? So, you know, are they actually um, in any shape or form able to control what goes on in trade and make sure that it is sustainable or has elements of sustainability? Thank you very much, Alison. Yeah, really good question. So the free trade agreements fulfill a number of different kind of purposes and objectives. They're not just for two countries coming together and, and doing more trade. They're, they're to cement a wider political, social, cultural kind of partnership or, or relations between those trade partners. The, the way that kind of world trade kind of works is that you've got countries that have their own domestic regulations that impact on what companies can and cannot do in terms of exporting and importing products. But then certain flows of it, you've got those, you've also got global rules, which were set by the WTO, but these were made a long, long time ago, okay, up to the, uh, the Uruguay round. No real new rules have been introduced of much substance since then. So in the gap, you've got these FTAs, of which there are, as I mentioned, 305 currently in force. And they can um, shape the commercial regulatory environment of companies trading between those FTA partners. Now, um, the extent to which they have reach into what companies actually do will depend on how substantive the trade agreements actually are. So the, the US, the EU, Japan, uh, the EFTA group, they tend to have quite developed, detailed, substantive, rules and regulations on trade. Other countries engaged in FTAs have quite loose, vague, open-ended rules. So if you take, for example, the ASEAN-China Free Trade Agreement, it only has about 40, 50 pages. If you look at the US-Australia FTA, it has about 2,000 pages, right? So FTAs can vary a lot. Um, companies will always find gaps <laughs> um, in the rules and um, it's you know they they have the capacity to do so so yeah they they will they will find their ways around these trade rules if if they are determined and can and they have the best trade lawyers and, and they can work out which ways they can get around things so it it does depend a lot i think on how companies are moving towards a culture of sustainability, integrating sustainability, climate action into what they do, and this then being reflected in how they trade. So, for example, you've got a number of different things that companies can sign up for. Um, there is the uh, they can sign up for the Paris Agreement, have their own emission reduction targets. They can be part of the UN Global Compact on adopting. Uh, standardized rules on reporting on sustainability practice. Uh, they can adopt the um, Sustainable Development Goals Compass mechanism for making sure they comply with the SDGs on everything they do, including trade. Uh, they can join the World Business Council on Sustainable Development and, and learn from other companies about sustainability best practice. And you'll find that if you look at the world's top 500 countries, about 93% of them have now sustainability reporting on an annual basis or some sort of sustainability strategy. 
how that plays down to the lower cascade of firms and small and medium sized enterprises is much more of a patchy kind of a pattern. But increasingly large firms know that they, they cannot ignore sustainability or climate action. They're, they're, I think they're smart enough to know this and Jeff and maybe some other people, Nick um, may have some comments on, on that. But um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting time. <laughs> to be looking at these issues and how companies, there's a cultural change going on in companies. Um, the, the civilizational purpose, which companies, enlightened ones, are seeing their role as being part of something bigger, not just to make money. It's not just as Milton Freeman said that the business of business is to make, is, is business. Businesses are seeing themselves much more, I think, some of them in more of a civilizational kind of uh, context. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. Top quality questions so far, I think. <laughs> Anyone else got any questions? Yes, you. So I believe in this case, yeah, um, it's a long history yeah, for some kind of like FTA, whatever. But in this case, is there any way as to measure the commitment actual commitment of different like countries or some kind of like communities or some kind of like um, companies, whatever, to such kind of like uh, um, climate actions, irrespective of what the what is it is written yes, in the FTA? That's a really good question, Liu. Um, I, that hasn't been, to my knowledge, that hasn't been done yet, sort of applying a, a key performance indicator type approach to exactly, climate yeah, action through like FTAs. That, yeah. yeah, that's that would be really, really useful, wouldn't it? To actually have, like like we do on companies reporting on their sustainability actions some key performance indicator standardization kind of processes there. There's something called the Global Reporting Initiative, which tries to um, provide a set of metrics for how sustainable companies are, are behaving. If you could apply that sort of approach to climate action through FTAs, yeah, that would be a, that's a really fantastic idea, <laughs> but it hasn't been devised yet. I think it's still too early in the, in the kind of um, the development of, of this, this connection between climate action and trade agreements. But uh, yeah, that's, that's a really good idea. I think in this case also, yes, with the development of like the computer technologies, techniques, mm. whatever, and also, of course, yes, there's a natural language processing understanding. So then it's possible, yes, to yes. automatically identify some kind of like actions or the change yes. of behaviors of like people as yes, companies or governments here. Yeah. In a yes. sense, they are commitment, they are making commitment to such kind of like climate changes and something. I, I believe, yes, that's certain actually at least the commitment to such yeah. kind of climate yes, actions yes, in the past, let's say, two decades or whatever, is improving. Is that the case or? So the, the sorry, Liu, can you just mention that last point again? Sorry. Um, essentially, yeah, in the past, the like 20 years, yeah, as the commitment um, of the government, people, mm. companies to such kind of like climate actions yeah, is improving. Yeah. Yes, I... In terms of climate actions generally, I mean, you, yeah. you can look at something some, something quite basic like uh, carbon yeah. dioxide emission reductions. It, it does get a bit complicated because, for example, if you look at Britain's carbon dioxide per head figures, it's gone down quite significantly. But a large reason for that is that British multinationals have offshored their carbon intensive activities to other countries and often to other countries which have lower environmental standards. It's what we call carbon leakage. So yeah. assessing countries in this way, there is something called the um, Environment Performance Index developed by Yale University, which looks at how well countries are performing on a range of environmental issues. They got about, I think it's 32 different kind of metric areas which they can study. So yeah, these kind of, structures of data analysis are gradually being put in place at a global or international level. And it's, it's vitally important, isn't it? Because otherwise- Yeah, we, indeed, yeah. Yeah, for various reasons, as you know. <laughs>
yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Very yeah. good. Thank you very much yeah. to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else got any other questions? Or is it lunchtime? <laughs> there is one more question in the chat, Chris, if you could. Oh, is there? Uh, okay. I mean, yes. So yes. let's have a look. Yes. Oh, there's quite a few. From so, Daniel. From Daniel. Yes. Okay. It's in the news today that 30,000 mink are being culled in Norway due to mink related COVID. There's a suggestion that global fur trade is going to collapse in response to COVID. Good explanation, more. yes. Do you think COVID will influence FTAs and climate change? Oh, that's a really good question, right? So, um, well, COVID is, is making it difficult for countries to negotiate <laughs> FTAs because they simply can't, um, well, they can meet by Zoom. They can have meetings like this, um, but in an FTA, you typically have about 30 different areas of regulation to negotiate and that involves often each area involves dozens of lawyers sitting around a table um, discussing what's going to happen you know trade-off between this and that so um, COVID is going to slow down FTA somewhat just simply because of practical kind of constraints I think that there'll be some kind of reset looking at everything including FTAs and what they're for I, I'd imagine that there'd be some stuff relating to um, pandemics and issues like COVID actually been included in FTAs, but it may help us to reevaluate generally what FTAs are for. So the, the last thing I mentioned was about the agreement on climate and trade and, and sustainability. Um, we may see a new kind of trade agreements emerge possibly in, in years to come. And COVID may be a catalyst to accelerating that process. There's a lot of obviously speculation about how COVID is gonna change things in various different areas of, of our society and our life. Uh, it's just too early to say uh, yet, but I'm hoping that it will help us to reevaluate everything. You know, what, what are trade agreements actually for? How's it gonna help make the world a better place? What things are we missing that we haven't kind of looked at before? So COVID, by helping us to think in new ways, it, it may help. It may lead to us thinking more about sustainability and climate action. I, I don't know. Others may have some ideas themselves on this. Anyone? It's all a bit speculative at the moment, but that's a really good, really good question. I think you tend to find after a major crisis that structural change happens. Yeah. Um, we'll have to see if that happens in, in trade agreements. Thank you, Daniel. Great question. I know you've left us, but just for the record, thanks for that. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Right, okay. Emery, is that, were there any other questions in the chat, Emery? Have I missed anything else? Uh, no, I don't see anything else. Thank you, Chris. It was a wonderful talk. I really enjoyed it. was very well, It's lovely to see you all. Thank you so much yeah. for being Thank part of it. Thank you for the talk. Yeah, thank you very much, everyone. So what we're going to do is hopefully we're going to put